from the uh, Department of Computer Science and Engineering and the final project is about the large scale L1 regularized and L2 regularized and this is the version and the outline of the different version of this I will introduce the uh, motivation and introduction of this project to its content and the uh, background of uh, the theoretical uh, information about the logistic version and the realization Followed by my experiments and conclusions. And at first, this is a project that my other activity and task project ideas come to me, and the request is the implementation of L1 realization and L2 realization on the logistic realization just on like open source large scale framework. Because uh, they are like uh, it's simple and has good performance. And the, uh, most widely used machine learning methods in both in industry and, and the academics are uh, in 2014. And the Spark is selected for my bio project because uh, they have proposed many different life like, skill platforms, but this is the uh, only one still like today. And uh, since so there is no complete uh, implementation in 2014, but a uh, remarkable achievement can be provided in national methods so there are also many enormous efforts uh, both from industry and academia have been invested to this field. So L1 regularization and L2 regularization on logistic regulation has been completely implemented uh, just in the many review study several months ago. So uh, my project is about to help understand the L1 regulation and L2 regulation uh, on the digital regulation and how to start on the uh, If you want to do machine learning with a uh, large scale data, you really can do or uh, implement it with this if you want to have higher performance. And the some investigation of performance for regulation, that's the digital regulation to relatively large scale data case. Uh, we will look at the L1 regulation, L2 regulation, elastic regulation, and the two different, or today I'll say two different properties will be investigated uh, uh, with their time code accuracy and so on. And so that, that's all about the theoretical information. It's about uh, logistic regulation, regulation, and uh, some introduction to start. Uh, and logistic regulation, there is a uh, regression in the same in the classification. Method. Uh, this is uh, an example which can use your distribution to classify like food chips and benches based on the uh, X and Y and Z are different uh, taste of scores of each chip. Uh, and first, it's just on sigmoid functions which can be displayed in this graph and it operates between 1 and 0, so it can uh, uh, indicate probability. And when we we'll connect it with this uh, directed graph, uh, we can have like uh, the formula of that uh, we when we classify samples. And uh, from this, when it's on um, the binary one, we can have uh, the sum of two probabilities can be one. Just we only need one to put this or the that the negative likelihood is also defined as the loss function of logistic regulation. This is a, a quite simple formula here. And uh, uh, since we have the negative likelihood, uh, we have likelihood we can use that an LE method to solve it, uh, solve it given a uh, uh, faster solution. And, uh, uh, if we have negative then uh, it can become a simple optimization method. And the intuitive we will really solve it by differential equation for the equation. But after we differentiate it, we will get a transcendental equation and there is no close form for that so far. But the differentiability makes it many other optimizations uh, available. And the one we want to deal with multi-class was this configuration of what the max function will be authorized to make the sum of different probabilities to be one. And we can transform the labels in the one-half box 
format to choose for, uh, formulation uh, to, to choose for like um, to the, the loss functions and so on uh, and other states can all be similar to the binary one and it can be seen as a prototype of artificial neural network and the binary logic to the regression has a uh, format like this and the multi uh, class logic to the regression has more labels okay. Uh, and the output is easier and more hidden layer than here is because an artificial neural network. And uh, uh, since there are some like, overfitting and uh, underfitting problems and other machine learning uh, algorithms, it needs visualization. And uh, uh, this is a uh, linear regulation example just for uh, some intuition about the overfitting extensive. It's in, uh, intuitively it's caused by we use like two complicated models for simple data and it can cause some results like this you know, this simulation. And, and for the underfitting, it can uh, be described intuitively because we use two simple models for complex data sets. And it can also make the multi simulation um, that work uh, on like this, uh, this can be caused too much visualization and then can be caused by like low or too late visualization. And uh, this is the form of L1 visualization and we choose the first function like this like before and we end the L1 norm of uh, model parameters. So, and uh, the lambda is the visualization parameter to control uh, how much we will put visualization on this model and uh, uh, M is the number of data sets which is used, just used uh, uh, to make the formula more complex after the rating. And this is the L2 realization. That's a uh, change the L1 norm to L2 norm and the uh, uh, change for the reality over here and the also has the regularization parameter to control the regularization. Um, how much regulation of the area to this function. And the uh, elastic mean regulation is a way to combine L1 and L2 regulation. It has an uh, elastic weight parameter which will be added uh, comp uh, much like with the L1 norm and the 1 minus this parameter times the L2 norm. In fact, it is also the implementation, actual implementation on start. Since this share, we can see we share the uh, regularization parameter here, so we, uh, in our experiment, we need to decide a best regularization parameter. And uh, uh, in my experiment, I use uh, the best uh, uh, regularization uh, and uh, the for L1 regularization and uh, the best regularization parameter for L2 regularization, and I use the mean of them. And, and for the spark, it's, since it's the only still live official uh, large scale processing platform is hard, general, and popular. The large scale data processing is a serious similarity and it's on the everywhere and it's a serious. And for the speed, uh, it can be 100 times faster than hard speed, which is uh, another like uh, acceleration for the processing platform. And uh, it can be advanced to uh, direct it to uh, the class. Uh, execution and and this can be very uh, informative for other uh, PhD based models introduced in our class and uh, it's been reacting in uh to talk a frequency uh of four of com um which can uh, interact uh, with uh, other common platforms or data set set formats uh in three libraries. And we can see is uh, support like simple pairs with the or use the or common when we deal with large scale data. And some screening just are screening like support because uh, when we deal with large scale data there is easy to have some um discounts or something going wrong and we can help recover. As long as we work all over the space that we when we say Windows, when we are uh, like our top windows or we have some data, it, it can help or we do without any extra code or IO. And uh, 
or it also provides machinery library which can be used in uh, Python since Python is quite uh, easily and uh, you can deal with programmable language. So Python is used uh, in my experiment and there are some like, tips about uh, running a task I see if you have some uh, please you can ask me about details. And the it's include an old library and a new library with to uh, provide a configuration support for the logistic uh, situation. And uh, for my experience, I have two data sets. The first uh, is a prediction test uh, to determine whether a per person match over 50,000 a year of 50,000 dollars a year with 14 different features. And after creating out all sample to missing features, we just all around uh, 30,000 instances for training and 15,000 instances for test. And both of which are around 25% uh, policy standard, so they're that's, uh, slightly unbalanced with it. And there is the default data set provided by Lestat. It's also a binary transfer decision test that has only like uh, 100 samples, and uh, they are random choose of uh, the around uh, 80 samples for 10 and 10 samples or 20 samples for this. And uh, they are uh, balanced the best fit. And the each sample consists of 619 pieces. You can see in, for the first one, you have much same number of samples than the number of features. And this one has still have much uh, number of features than the number of samples. This um, means this one can be easily to get like uh, over this, it can be seen in our experiment. Uh, yes, I found my uh, settings in my experiment and uh, as you see sometimes and use the average data statistics for the time code. And uh, from the training, we can see the app, our access is the iteration and one axis is, is the lowest function value. And this is L1 visualization and LC visualization just on the end of the set which we have much more or number of, of uh, samples than the number of features. Uh, and uh, we can see many like lines in this figure has disappeared because we have only have large uh, visualization parameters it can solve the optimization and the beginning. And this is for uh, the default reactions that we've seen patients in before. It's also stored some like uh, optimization and the beginning of that. Since the pure samples make the optimization can work better, the loss value can be a smaller, uh, more approaching to zero. And these are some like polling patients for L1 and L2 visualization, which is a full of end of the It's in the both of the two sides. Our uh, solutions, but uh, we we tend to have like uh, only L1 visualization for most fast or uh, uh, solutions. This may be because we only have a uh, future and many discrete features, and besides that, since we have like uh, much more data samples than the number of features, it can be easily like uh, on the thinking. So it can. When we have some uh, equalization, it can be easily to like to start to work. And uh, uh, this can and for the default data series, we can see for the uh, L2 version, we have more like to control the like uh, coefficient standard. This means can uh, and the while the L1 version can produce the most fast uh, results as we expect. And this is the accuracy. Uh, the training of the knowledge to the best accuracy we only we need to look it in a place they are set and uh, this is for uh, the uh, end of the answer and this is for the default answer. And we are only to put pressure and so we, we should like all uh, the from the best they are set different to do this. And you can see the time cost, uh, the machine can solve the L2 visualization much more faster uh, 
or when or before the O1 utilization speed up to solve the problem. And the uh, you know, actually so like the next thing is how many health we can go to the answer to the answer. And uh, there are still some like uh like uh line to clear because you have a larger uh utilization time we have to clear and uh a long way time to this more LI utilization is also stopped and uh beginning. And uh, uh also for the qualification then you can we will have uh this line has also the understanding this this place and uh the default level we can see you have more L to regulation the qualification of control is not clear. And uh this is uh operation actually used in a six place uh parameter. Yeah, both are this place of the performance is better when we have more L to regulation and the it, the solution is more powerful for it. And also the time test is we only have more L2 generation or pure L2 generation because it's much faster until it gets up to solve the uh, optimization problem. And, and when we, uh, when we can, uh, even larger data sets, the depth can be, can be bigger. So uh, in our uh, engineering, this uh, in fact, so maybe more L to the other things and uh, there are some conclusions about that or some conclusions can we can verify or uh, like uh, the specification of L L Y relation and L to the relation before and there are some also uncommon phenomena also observed like uh, the different uh include different influence and different uh, uh performance under the situation. Applications, you mean? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, especially the classification algorithm and, and the like the uh, beginning stage of machine learning is uh, uh, widely used to widely used for classifications, uh, like uh, some uh, conflict classifications. They based on like image net also to classify an uh, image. And uh, uh, in my uh, example, it is to classify a chip, whether a chip is good or not. Or since we can have different features of a chip and uh, we can use this to classify whether this chip is good or not. Thank you.
All right, hello everyone. Um, it says I'm Nick Geneva, uh, and I'm presenting on comprising graphical models with uh, my original title was neural networks, but we're going to generalize it to machine learning um, for structural representation of fast networks. All right, so originally, this I guess this presentation is kind of a story of how. I was originally going to focus on this paper up here, this 2016 NIPS paper, then basically got lost in one of the references, um, which actually ended up proposing a method that I found kind of interesting and wanted to understand um, because it motivated a lot of what kind of the ideas that are happening up in this one. So yeah. All right, so starting off, when we're building a model, whether it be a model to represent data, a model to generate data, whatever you want, um, generally you may have two different goals. You may want to have a flexible approach. So let's say you know you have some non-parametric representation of some complex high-dimensional data. Um, or you may want a structure approach. And this may be defined a structure representation of data that can then be generalized with the task. So in terms of flexible models, when I say flexible models, I mean, like I said, I, I'm talking about these black box methods. So machine learning, you're looking for buzzwords like neural networks, convolution neural networks, autoencoders, um, GANs, um, support vector machines. On the flip side, structured um, models, uh, of course, PGM class, so we're talking about probabilistic graphical models, stuff where we actually have values that mean something rather than just random weights and stuff that are just kind of matching up a function. So the question is, what do we want, what, what happens if we want both a flexible yet also structured approach? So what this means is essentially like if, if I want, like let's say like I have some high dimensional data that I need to map or something with some flexible method, but I also want some sort of values that I can then relate to maybe physical dynamics or something about the actual problem and conduct inference. So just the problem to kind of motivate this as an example, um, so let's suppose that we have this mouse that's inside of this spherical container moving around. And our input data is going to be some height. So basically our input is this image. Um, and from that, we want our output to basically be an uh, interpretable structure of essentially the mouse's actual behavior. So these may be the current um, stance that it's in or its movement and whatnot. So it's basically we have this high dimensional image coming in, so we kind of want a flexible model to learn that. But then with our output, we want to have some sort of probabilistic inference on what's probably if the mouse is actually sitting up on its hind legs or if it's scratching its ear and stuff like that. Those are very structured outputs. Um, so basically we want kind of a combination. And that's kind of the whole main idea of uh, this paper and kind of this whole, I think, growing field is essentially can we combine these to build stronger modeling tools that can really get the best of both worlds is essentially it. So for this, we won't be looking at mice. Um, we'll be looking at something a little bit more dull, um, which is a natural clustering problem. Uh, so these are just some examples. Uh, this is a really great toy problem. Um, the one we're gonna be looking at is spiral problems. Um, so basically in a spiral, um, and the reason for that is one, it's pretty simple, but then two, uh, also it's, um, you see that these clusters, we have very discrete clusters that we want to, you know, categorize. So each one of these we want to define as a different class. Um, however, they are also, they're non-Gaussian, so they're, they're this non-linear structure. And this is an unsupervised learning problem, so basically we don't have any pre-labels. So before we get into the actual paper, we're going to visit our old friend um, Gaussian mixture models um, to go over. Um, so this is the non-Bayesian formulation. Uh, you can find this in Bishop. Um, just to review, um, if you're like me and have a memory of a goldfish, um, you tend to forget this stuff. Um, however, the idea of the Gaussian mixture model is that we have um, a latent variable Z, which is binary variable, which represents which class um, of which Gaussian mixture we're pulling from. And we have, for each Gaussian mixture, we have a respective uh, mean and also precision. We can increase the complexity a little bit and make it kind of more Bayesian formulation by introducing some priors onto our precision and also our mean, which is seen up here. Um, so these are our hyperparameters that we're introducing. So this is just um, some reminders. Uh, again, if you want to know more, uh, lecture 18. Um, uh, so just to refresh your memory, so again, our joint distribution um, is going to be a um, 
the uh, multiplication of uh, essentially the likelihood in our priors and whatnot. The likelihood takes the form of, of course, our Gaussian. Um, Z is binary. Uh, um, yeah, just mixing coefficients. We're just going to go kind of fast through this so I have plenty of time afterwards. Yeah, I don't need to say anything here. All right, so just to refresh uh, your memory uh, for actually um, conducting, for tuning this probabilistic reference model to conduct inference and whatnot, it's a, like similar to e &M algorithm with this uh, Bayesian method, we have to take kind of a variational approach which involves maximizing lower bound. We all know that. And it's an alternate step. So basically we ping pong back and forth between essentially updating the responsibilities, computing the relevant statistics related to those um, responsibilities, and also updating the hyperparameters. So basically, you have to jump back and forth between these to then converge the actual solution. Uh, in predictive information, we don't need that. Now, the problem with this, for our problem of interest, is basically uh, we can't actually describe these regions very um, efficiently. And like I hinted at that before, um, we chose this problem specifically because these are indeed, they don't really fit Gaussians. So essentially, even though we're able to fit the data through mixture, we don't really get the five discrete classes that we actually originally wanted. So let's look at something completely different now. So let's say, all right, so this was the structured result. So now let's go to entirely flexible result. Um, and the idea here is that now instead of essentially having you know, this mixture of Gaussians, we're going to basically be using a narrow network to essentially predict, to predict a mean and also a precision. So this is now our likelihood, and you can see that our, our actual mean and also our precision is now, so weights, biases of the neural network. Um, so now this is actually a function that's basically being produced here. Now, of course, the issue with this is obvious. Um, we've lost all sort of categorizing is essentially it. Sure, we can fit this very nicely. We get very nice densities where the actual data is, but in the way of classifying the different actual clusters, um, we're out of luck. All right. So now we're going to switch papers um, to this uh, later paper um, that um, back in 2012, um, and we're going to be talking about a method, uh, well, just kind of general approach called rapid mixture models. And the core idea is essentially in its name. So we're going to take a mixture model, so on the left, and basically wrap it in some sort of function that transforms basically the, these latent variables, which are determined from the mixture model, into a non-Gaussian, into basically non-Gaussian manifolds, is essentially it. So the idea is that instead of using this as the direct output, we're going to map it through some sort of function to then get a much more complex output, yet we'll also retain the uh, structured um, representations. So here's what we're looking at um, here. So basically everything, um, most of it has remained the same. Um, I'll talk about this and break it down in more detail, but um, we've now added this arbitrary function over here. And for this, um, in the paper we're going to be following it, it's, it's going to be a Gaussian process. So writing this down on the left, this is actually precisely the Bayesian um, um, Gaussian mixture model that we had before. Exactly, actually. Um, except the key difference is that now the outputs are not the actual observations. They're not a set of latent variables. So these don't actually have really true meaning. They're not what we're seeing. As, it's not what our actual data. Um, I also want to note here that I, for simplicity, I predefine um, a set of mixture components K. Uh, however, you can indeed have an infinite set, which is what they do in the paper, uh, through a dairy play process and give sampling of that, but I won't be going, going into that today. Now, on the right side, basically this is now going to be our Gaussian process. Here. So basically, this is going to be mapping these latent variables here to a non-Gaussian manifold, is the idea. Um, and I say here that this is a Gaussian process, however, um, this is not actually inclusive. So you can extend this idea to other sort of methods, however you actually want to map, however you want to define this function. Um, it's just what we're always going to do this for the sake of the paper. Um, I do note here that um, that basically, so this right here, uh, so we have inputs that are latent variables um, that feed into Gaussian process and then out um, observations. This is precisely a Gaussian process latent variable model. In fact, if we ignore this whole section out here and we just take these guys as basically fixed, 
it's precisely a Gaussian latent variable model. So, in essence, you can view this as a more generalized version of GPL theorems. So, if you're like me and you're not too well versed on Gaussian on latent variable models, we're going to go over it. So, the idea, the, the key principle is that instead of having, um, so you're going to represent your likelihood through a zero mean Gaussian and your actual covariance matrix is going to be defined through a kernel function down here. Now, the key thing that makes this you know, latent variable models is that this kernel function is governed through latent variables. So these variables aren't related to your actual, well, they do get related, but they're, they're latent variables, basically it. Now, of course, um, we need to optimize these latent variables, so we need to tune this model so we can get desired results. Um, that is done basically through gradient-based optim optimization. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just quickly list some gradients here. Um, you can see that basically we want a cost function, which is going to likely here, like the observations, getting latent variables, and also the theta is going to represent our parameters in the um, GPLVM. And essentially, this using chain rule, you can see that basically this combined with this will give you the derivative of the. Uh, of your cost function, so your log of your likelihood um, with respect to your um, actual latent variables. So you can tune them and optimize them however you want. All right, so now moving into the actual paper now. So we're gonna break this down and look into three parts of this actual, of this wrap mixture model. So we're gonna talk about generation, because this is a generative model. And we're gonna talk about the training of it. And we're gonna talk about um, briefly prediction. So some of our GPL VMs, um, Essentially, this, this is a generative model. So we can generate realizations from this PGM, um, basically generate a set of latent variables and then feed it through our Gaussian process onto non-Gaussian manifolds, is the idea. So the idea is, I summarize this in three steps. So for each component, we're going to, uh, so if you remember, going back to our uh, PGM here, so the first step is that we want to draw precision and also mean for each component, right, from our uh, priors, which is here. Um, somewhere as we always define, um, this is a Wishart distribution, and this is also just a Gaussian distribution here. Uh, we can then um, draw a function. So this is basically if you have priors over your actual parameters and your Gaussian process, um, you can actually draw those parameters. Um, for your GP, and that formulates your function that's then going to map these latent variables into your non Gaussian space. And then for, oops, uh, for each desired observation that you want, um, you can then um, draw a assignment. So you just choose which class you want, and from that, draw a set of latent variables from your PGM. So this is from your um, Gaussian, and then you feed those X's through your Gaussian process to generate a Y. Now, that's nice, but we still have to worry about how do we actually get this model to learn? How do we train it? Um, so we have two systems, um, or I'm going to refer to them as two systems. So basically we have the PGM and we also have the GP. Um, and we're going to be optimizing those simultaneously. Uh, and basically we want to, we want to um, maximize uh, this likelihood here, like the deleted variables. So this is different originally than our GP procedure. But however, if we expand it out, we see that it actually is. And this is the kind of the core idea here is that essentially we have, we break it apart. Um, we actually have the, the likelihood that was from our Gaussian process, but then we have essentially this, you can consider it like a prior is basically it. So we have this complex prior that's getting tagged onto our um, loss function, which is then going to improve its performance. And this is basically, this idea right here is the same concept that is used actually also in the 2016 paper that I was supposed to really focus on, but it, it's, the same, it's the same idea. Essentially, they're tacking on a more complex, uh, more descriptive uh, prior onto their loss function, uh, which basically allows them to do a lot cooler stuff. Um, yeah. So. To kind of evolve this, um, in this paper, they use a hybrid Monte Carlo or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to basically sample. Uh, I say kind of move because I, me coming from a very you know, netish kind of background in terms of research, I think gradient, but it's sampling. So we're going to sample a set of particles. 
from, uh, from basically uh, this posterior here. So the idea there is essentially we're going to have an initial set of latent variables. Um, if you recall, um, HMC, basically we're then going to propagate those using anatomic dynamics. So to do that, we need the gradients. Um, the gradients here is actually, uh, so if we take the log of this, right? So log split across and we have the sum of these. Um, so we recall that the gradients here is exactly comes from our GP. So that's, we already have these here. And then the derivative of our prior is analytical because it's a PGM and we can control, we can say that we want some nice distributions here that allows us to, you know, find this attractable um, actual um, solution. So yeah, so basically once once the particles are sampled with HMC, so essentially we have a set, then propagate a little bit um, through a set amount of steps, so like 25 or whatever, um, we then update the PGM. So basically this new set of particles within which are latent variables, act as observations for the PGM. And then essentially, then we take over and we do the standard um, mixture of Gaussian optimization process of you know the variational approach, or if you're not doing a Bayesian and any ENM approach, and then optimize the PGM. Then you go back, you return to the Gaussian process, you optimize, and then basically um, you repeat, you jump back and forth. So in summary, uh, essentially, um, we have a set of training observations Y. Um, we have an initial set of latent variables X. Um, and we're looking for these training parameters here. Um, so theta, again, is our Gaussian process um, parameters. So length scales or whatever, some additional noise term. And then these are all part of our actual um, PGM. So the first step is that we're going to calculate the gradient of our potential here. We then going to conduct HMC, so essentially we're going to take every single particle, we're going to move it a little bit, move it a little bit towards the posterior, and then that sample right there, after a set amount of steps, will then act as the new set of latent observations for the probabilistic graphical model. From here, we then conduct the inference on the PGM. We iterate back and forth between computing the responsibilities and the actual uh, parameters, the hyperparameters, and we update them. And then down here, I did not mention this, but essentially the, um, the parameters in the Gaussian process are also updated through agency also. So basically they sample length scales and noise terms and slowly propagate those as well. And basically this entire process then loops over and over and over until you deem convergence or your epoch has been reached. Uh, yeah, so this is a quick um, discussion um, regarding the uh, uh, predictive distribution. So this is a little bit, it's a little bit involved. Um, essentially, uh, we have to do a Monte Carlo approximation, unfortunately. Um, well, I say unfortunately, but yeah. And uh, the main reason behind that is because we're using Monte Carlo to actually sample these latent variables and optimize it. Um, but uh, I will say here that, um, so breaking apart our actual predictive distribution, um, where Y star is going to be our new observation that we're interested in, and X star is going to be uh, our new actual latent variable and whatnot. Um, so if we kind of split this up and separate it, uh, we can see that this guy here, this is actually done through HMC. So um, this is um, done through agency. This is also, so this is basically done by sampling. Uh, we marginalized, uh, yeah, so we compute this by essentially sampling a bunch of new latent variables from our PGM and feeding them forward through the network. And this right here is actually the, uh, the GP um, predictive distribution, which there's actually, there's the land analytical form because it's just two Gaussians getting stuck together. All right. So in conclusion, I will more hope that this works. I don't know which Oh, I have no internet connection. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, I'll just kind of I'll just kind of illustrate this here. So essentially, um, this, if you look on the slides, uh, basically uh, this is a movie that illustrates this whole process. So the idea is that on um, on the right uh, we have a set of observations in a spiral. Um, basically, these uh, we um, through the GP. Um, these are translated to a set of latent variables. 
um, that we then propagate through uh, HMC. Um, the PGM then tries to map a set of mixtures onto that. And then um, over here, we then basically sample a bunch from these, and then this represents the sampling by the colors. Um, and this also shows in the paper of how um, it uses the set of volumes and whatnot, the number of mixtures um, through get sampling. So yeah, and that's, that's it. It's just amount of time. And also uh, references. Any questions? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about the uh, a paper that has been recently published in 2017. That is, uh, learning the network structure of the heterogeneous data via uh, pairwise exponential macro random field. And uh, in this, we can observe there are three uh, main uh, important keywords. One is the uh, learning the network structure. Second one is uh, what data. It's uh, heterogeneous in nature. And the third one is what model we are going to do. We are going to uh, uh, we are going to uh, pairwise exponential macro random field. And uh, this is the outline of my uh, uh, this thing. That, I mean, talk today. First, I'll be giving an introduction of what it is. Next, uh, the motivation of it, of the of the uh, work, and then later uh, the uh, problem definition. And then I'll, I'll be talking very in detail about uh, PE MRF. And later, uh, since uh, there is one term that is uh, the um, log partition function which is not tractable, so computationally, so we go for approximated uh, maximum likelihood instead of going for exact maximum likelihood. And then later, uh, I'll be discussing about uh, optimization technique called uh, ADMM, that is alternating direction uh, method of uh, multipliers. And then I'll, I'll show you brief results of what uh, is obtained, and then the conclusion. So, what is um, Markov random field? Like its importance of Markov random field is like its importance is a fundamental tool to many uh, 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 applications in machine learning. And uh, also, it is necessary for this MRF, uh, I mean, to model this MRF for uh, heterogeneous entities. So, for example, if you have a me medical database and uh, which are uh, heterogeneous in nature, so that is, it, it has a relationship between the ca categorical and the uh, continuous variables. So, for example, the age, gender, the medical history of uh, of all the patients, and the other interesting uh, uh, area where it can be uh, used is for when uh, uh, analyzing the uh, protein interaction. So uh, with this, uh, there is one more major, uh, uh, like in major field which implements this, and that is in com computational uh, uh, biology, which is the main fundamental task for this is to infer the structure. And uh, what is happening uh, till now? People uh, in, in uh, people used to use this uh, Gaussian graphical models, uh, but uh, in in nowadays with this uh, new technologies of this DNA sequencing, uh, we can which produces a data with, uh, with heterogeneous distribution. And uh, this graph, uh, uh, so Gaussian graphical models will not be able to uh, uh, extract or uh, uh, generate the structure for this, for um, heterogeneous domain. So because of this, we are going to uh, outline the entire talk to now in this four. First one is we are going to see what is uh, PEMRF. And then second, we are going to uh, approximate the, uh, we are going to formulate an approximate uh, maximum likelihood problem and then deriving a tractable upper bound and then on the log partition function and then later uh, a scalable uh, ADMM al uh, optimization algorithm uh, with the closed form updates. And then we, have, we will also observe that it's then our estimator is a uh, sparsient. So what is PEMRF? So, so before going to uh, definition of PEMRF, so there's some, uh, uh, the, these are the basic definitions that we're going to consider. 
first we will consider that our data is like an independent multivariate observation and then later these samples are IID from an exponential family of uh, color distribution x, uh, p of x comma theta and then later was represented by p no graphical model uh, with a natural parameter theta and uh, and we use these samples to estimate the underlying distribution and this is the uh, in general uh, like we have learned in PGM uh, where v is my node of vertices and e is my edge and the length of this is p and also the structure is encoded with this exponential family parameter theta. So uh, we will discuss a brief about this a PMRF. A PMRF is a subclass of multivariant expon uh, uh, exponential family that can expli uh, explicitly relieve the uh, Markov structure across heterogeneous variables. And uh, here, this, these are the few notations that we will follow in this uh, slide, following slides. The inner product is given by this trace of AB, and also the, we also concatenate the set of variable vectors in this form. Okay, so let's consider a random vector uh, with x, x1 to xp, and then later, which are heterogeneous, and within this domain, uh, x is a chronicle product of this variable. So, what is the uh, chronicle product? product if we have a matrix A which is A1, A2, A3, A4 and B, uh, so we multiply each element of this A1 to this uh, matrix B and A to this matrix B, so that is the uh, chronicle product here and then later uh, suppose we, uh, the, the, the conditional distribution of each variable is XR given all my previous P, P-1 variables are, uh, are known to be the exponential family distribution uh, in this domain, uh, Z, sorry, Psi R. CR, okay, so yeah. And then later, uh, the distribution is also specified with this uh, MR uh, dimension load uh, potential with uh, BR and uh, as BR into X of R and my scale based parameter of CR into X of R. And then my, uh, let, okay, this is, the, this is the main joint distribution for this. The condition is that my X is equal, X1 to XP, sh we should follow this jo joint distribution where A of theta is my uh, log partition function and uh, theta is my the uh, node parameter sorry this x parameter and this theta small theta is my uh, node parameter. So yeah theta 1 to theta p uh, so where uh, small theta is the node parameter and the big theta is my or the capital theta is my h parameter and A of theta is my uh, uh, log partition function which is expressed in this uh, equation. Okay, so now uh, this is a small brief. Uh, like, uh, like we are going to uh, say we are going to define this p of x in terms of this uh, exponential family expression. So where b of x is nothing but my sufficient statistics. This is my base parameter, and a of theta is my uh, log partition function. And this inner product, I define it in this fashion. Okay, so the next uh, important thing is uh, what happens at one node. So one at node conditional uh, distribution, what happens? So, at node conditional distribution, at, for my, at my given node XR, given all my known uh, condition on my all, all my previous nodes, that which we, we all know that it's an exponential deluxe exponential family, is given by this expression, and I don't have A of theta because I've given up a proportional sign here, where my sufficient statistics is this uh, are, are these uh, uh, variables and these values and base parameter of this, these values. Okay. The reason why, because we are going, we, we are doing node by node ba uh, basis. Because of that, I defined that uh, the uh, node conditional distribution. Okay, next, the PMRF model can is a popular distribution which uh, which can ranging from a homogeneous to uh, mixed ones, and then later uh, from a node conditional distribution in previous equation we can that is uh, which I which I showed we can design a PMRF for a node by node basis by choosing a desired uh, my uh, base parameter and my uh, sufficient statistics that is BR and CR. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, by desired, desired potential BR and my base measure uh, CR. And note that this is a joint, this is valid if I am able to obtain a value for A of theta. But my A of theta is computationally intractable, so that's the reason why we go for uh, approximate uh, uh, log likelihood. Okay. So, for example, uh, I'll just give an example of a unit Gaussian distribution where my uh, the distribution is one divided by square root of two sigma, uh, square root of two pi sigma square into uh, exp exponential of minus 
x minus mu the whole square divided by 2 sigma square and when my uh, when I uh, expand that x minus mu square and then I when I equate it to my exponential family distribution I do get that my these parameters sufficient statistics are nothing but my x and uh, x and xr and uh, if I have a vari uh, variance then my theta r is described by minus 1 divided by 2 into sigma r square okay so uh, as I mentioned earlier my a of theta is not tractable so what we are going to do we are going to observe for this approximate uh, maximum log likelihood and uh, the equation I mean the, the, the formulation is given by this where minus l of theta plus r lambda of theta here my l of theta is nothing but the inner product minus a of theta and r, r lambda of theta is nothing but my uh, regularization term and where which is again uh, where I can fine tune with the parameter lambda uh, which encourages sparsity. So it gives me the entire spectrum of my sparsity. So what happens uh, if my lambda is less and what happens if my lambda is high in a structured graph. So and again in this we use uh, L1 or L2 uh, group lasso penalty. So this uh, one I have taken it from the Murphy book chapter 23 I believe. So this is an example. Uh, so for this my lambda is very high. So it is very sparse in nature. And uh, for this my lambda is equal to zero so it is very dense in nature. So my lambda gives me a very big spectrum of my uh, uh, sparsity. Okay. So next important thing is the approximate ma maximum li likelihood. Log sorry, likelihood. So for this, uh, we go for approximate because a of theta inverse high dimensional integral and it's typically intractable. And uh, in order to do this, uh, we uh, replace a of theta with an tractable or convex upper bound u of theta. Uh, for my uh, problem 4. So uh, before proceeding for me to obtain a value for u of theta or a of theta, so we need uh, we need to uh, recall all our notations because uh, from the I have taken that uh, the value of a of theta or u of theta from the other paper, so, I mean a different paper. Uh, so in order to have a compact notation, I will just recall everything again. So theta is my natural parameter and b of x is my sufficient statistics. and uh, it, and it's in this domain, and also my inner product is expressed in this fashion, which we all rem uh, we, we remember like a uh, uh, few slides back. And also here, the new thing is we're going to define uh, the mean parameters in this fashion. And uh, this is for my uh, node, and this is for so this is for my edge. So my node is for my edge, and where my expectation of the br of xr is nothing but my mu r, and uh, for the uh, similarly for the edge parameter. And also uh, one more important thing is. We are going to express it in this uh, form. That is, we are going to map the uh, for the node and the edge parameter with this uh, in, in this matrix. Okay. The reason I mentioned it because in this book, in this sorry, in this paper, uh, Jordan paper, uh, he gives an uh, expression for the upper bound. The log partition function e of theta has the following upper bound, and uh, here the same notations what I had defined before is used here in this paper. And uh, this is a, just a brief explanation of how we have obtained this one. So in particularly, we obtain the uh, upper bound relationship between the entropy h of x and the entropy of the node potential uh, given by this. In addition to the different choices of LR, uh, where R, because I have till my P node uh, this thing, so it goes from uh, R1 to P for uh, heterogeneous domains. So I have this uh, expression for A of theta. Now, if by taking the relaxation of this dual, we can convert this high dimension problem from the above uh, theorem, that is our above mentioned equation, to the following uh, tractable form. So this, the, uh, the same expression we can re relate in this, where f of 2 is expressed in this uh, equation here. Later, we are going to plug in this a of theta into the main equation here, uh, sorry, into the main equation here, and then later simplifying it we obtain this optimization problem where we have to minimize this and where this is my positive different ma matrix where my theta belongs to and uh, it, this this expression is nothing but the expression that we had observed when Cody Becker uh, explained it uh, uh, yesterday, yesterday afternoon so where he explained uh, this group lasso uh, so group graphical lasso yesterday so this is something similar to that so to make it group uh, graphical lasso, what we do is we uh, for a zero mean graph Gaussian MRF with additional constraints. That is, uh, if if two, my, if my two uh, if my two nodes are conditionally independent, then what we do is uh, we set it to zero uh, such that. 
and in our case from it is equal to the graphical lasso but there's one difference in the optimization procedure what he uh, what he has followed and what is followed here in that uh, the uh, the graphical lasso opt it optimizes you uh, with respect to the empirical covariance matrix but in our case uh, what we do is we optimize with respect to using the sample average of the sufficient statistics of the uh, PMRF so since we are talking about the uh, optimization procedure uh, we are going to uh, we are going to adopt this alternating uh, direction uh, method of uh, multipliers, and uh, I'll just give you a brief uh, explanation of what uh, ADMM is, and then uh, and then explain again. Go back to the paper and uh, like how the uh, how, how it has been implemented. So this is just a small uh, explanation, and uh, ADMM is an optimization algorithm. It's also a complex optimization problem by breaking into smaller pieces, uh, each of which can e easily then be handled. So for example, let us consider uh, this should be an objective function. We have to uh, minimize this objective function f of x plus g of z. And we have two design variables, that is uh, x and z, which is su subjected to a constraint, that is uh, ax plus bz equals c. And now, uh, we define an augmented Lagrangian with this free parameter rho, which is uh, greater than 0. And we say that uh, our L uh, is nothing but the objective function plus u, uh, u transpose of uh, this uh, constraint here plus my uh, free parameter to the norm 2. And uh, what we do is first we uh, update x. For updating x we take the value of z of the previous state and u of the previous state. And then later uh, we uh, update z. When we are updating z we take the updated value of x and then we update uh, uh, we update the uh, z but we, we do not have the updated value of u so we are using the previous updated value here and later we get the closed form uh, solution with uh, with this uh, with this expression here and uh, that is the reason why it is known as alternating uh, direction because we do it for x then we do it for z and then we do it again at last for closed form solution for uk uh, you, you, I mean so we do it until uh, the st stop criterion is mentioned so this is in general. So basically, we have to update these three parameters. So again, coming back to this problem here, uh, we again formulate it again, saying that we have to minimize this, and again we say that uh, we have to update three things: theta update, z update, and u update. It is the same thing, but for this problem, uh, we formulate t, uh, t, uh, t for theta update. This is the formulation where uh, eta is nothing but rho by n, and uh, this is nothing but q. Uh, this is my eigenvalue um, decomposition. And uh, later for z update, again this is the expression uh, which we have already seen. And also uh, this is for my u update, it is a closed form solution. So I will be able to get an uh, optimum value. Okay. Uh, again, uh, though ROC, it is used for uh, to visualize the way for to inspect the performance of classification. And uh, in this we have to uh, x axis and y axis which is true positive and uh, false positive. And mo more the curve is towards the left le left upper part of my corner, then the system is accurate. It's predicting the value, and uh, since the area under this curve gives gives me the uh, precision. Okay, uh, I've taken a small toy problem because uh, I did not get the data set what the paper has implemented. So in this uh, in this forum, I've taken uh, eight Bernoulli, eight Gamma, eight Gaussian, and eight uh, Dirichlet with k is equal to three. And uh, there are two cases. One is sparse case. Other is the uh, dense case. For sparse case, I have taken uh, the 10% of the potential uh, edge that exists, and uh, for dense case, I have taken the 50% of the potential edge exists. And then these are the results that I have obtained. Uh, this is for highly sparse structure, and this for low sparse structure. And uh, we can observe that uh, that the um, that they illustrate that the graph with the high degree of sparsity. Uh, to recover with few samples, it is much possible. So that is this is much better. Uh, that is, they illustrate this. And uh, uh, okay, this, again, this is uh, the same R O C curve. Again, to conclude, uh, to conclude this. So in this work, we have discussed the method uh, for learning the Markov networks. That is from uh, for observational data. And then this. Uh, PMRF is a multivariant uh, which uh, exponential famous will suit it for heterogeneous data which is much required for example you take a medical database or something like that and uh, then uh, we have not used uh, uh, exact use approximate uh, maximum likelihood for this problem and we have also developed a ADMM algorithm which can which gives me a closed form updates 
and uh, these are the references and from this paper uh, I have taken the uh, uh, like the main the main paper that I have referred and for the uh, uh, to obtain A of theta I have uh, that A of theta the upper bound uh, I have referred for this paper and uh, this paper gives a brief uh, explanation of uh, like how do we go about uh, uh, using the approximate le dog left lever. I am Abhishek Das from the physics department and I will be talking about the generation of a handwritten like image uh, using variation autoencoder and it has been trained on the MNIST data set. Uh, the outline is that uh, introduction a little bit about machineries which are like standard we start with standard autoencoder we introduce variational inference variational autoencoder, batch normalization and then result and plots. So I will be talking about a little bit in detail about these machineries because I learned about them while starting after starting working on this project itself. I'm new to computation. So an autoencoder network is a pair of two connected networks. One is encoder and one the other is decoder as everyone knows. Uh, the encoder component makes a denser representation of the original data in general uh, array or grid of pixels and then we call that encoded information and the decoder part decodes it back to the original dimension usually high, higher than the denser representation like this. This is a MNAS data set obvious. So, in general, the output of the decoder network would not match with the input. That's why we train it using the input itself. So, this is a kind of self-supervised learning rather than supervised or unsupervised. It's in, in the middle of those two. Uh, recent, in recent years, many impressive innovations have been made in the neural net architecture, such as dense net. Uh, recurrent neural networks and others and some mathematical tools have been introduced like batch normalization and autoregressive flow etc to improve the performance of these machineries uh, as explained earlier the encode autoencoders are self-supervised learning at models if we attempt to use autoencoders to generate data points uh, like new data points then it fails because it, on it can only give us output replicating the re denser representation of our original input so it cannot create new things so it's that's what that's where standard autoencoders lack so this is a kind of an example of the re 2d uh, representation of the MNIST data set where we have like 28 into 28 dimension we have converted it to the two dimension and saw their distribution and it's kind of discrete there is no continuity from one the representation data points of one digit to the other so we won't want that because yeah it's difficult to generate models while the distribution is like that in generative models we would not want only to replicate data that we used it to train in the first place but also would want to sample data points from the distribution the latent space and decode them 
to form tensors in the higher dimensional space to generate similar data points. Uh, these are the shortcomings of Ottenberg. I believe already explained that. So let me skip it. So, so suppose we we have a lot of data points of the handwritten digits, and we wanna create a model to get the probability distribution of like of those data points. Now, these images are 28 by 28. So, to get a maximum likelihood, we would have to get a mean of 28 into 28 dimension and a, and a covariance matrix of the similar dimension those are very computationally intractable that's why the idea of autoencoders comes into play in the first place to get a more compressed representation so from the probabilistic graphical model framework we can say that the variation of autoencoder contains a specific probability model of data x in terms of latent variables z, we write the joint probability distribution like that. Everyone knows it is a conditional distribution. This is the z is the latent, latent variable and x is our visible data points. And this is the Bayes theorem. We all know that. So, according to Bayes theorem, is that p of z given x is P of x given z times p z over p x. This in the denominator itself is very difficult to compute. It's very computationally expensive. That's why we use variational inference to approximate the posterior with a family of distribution q lambda of z given x, where lambda are the variational parameters which represents the parameters of the distribution we are trying to fit. For example, if q were a normal distribution, it would mean the new xi and sigma xi for uh, individual data points xl. And we would use full KL divergence, which would quantify the information lost when we try to replace the probability distribution p with q. Lambda is a very detailed De derivation of that I don't think we have time for that but yeah KL divergence is defined as the expected expectation value of the log of Q lambda over Q and we can express in that a subtracted form and using Bayes theorem we can express it in the like a form of equation 2 like here the approximate po optimal posture is there for to get approximate ap optimal posture we minimize scale divergence with respect to lambda to get that optimized q lambda but the intractable term log of px still lurks within the expression of the KL divergence like this is equal to that and that term is very computationally expensive so we want to remove that that's why we just flip side and express log of px as this a subtracted form of two expectation values plus KL divergence. Now we know that KL divergence is always non-negative. So it's, uh, I'm sorry, so its minimum value is zero. So to, to maximize this, we want to minimize this and maximize this term. So now this becomes a bit tractable to compute. And in variational inference, we use uh, the ELBO technique where it's the into the sum of terms dependent only upon the single data points. This allows for the use of stochastic gradient descent with respect to the variational parameters lambda for a given data point xi. The ELBO are defined as this. 
or we we can also write like this so log tx is expectation of log of p of x given z minus p l divergence of q lambda z given x and p z minus p l divergence of q lambda z given x and p z given x so we want to optimize log px by trying to find the lower bound of the quantity inside the curly bracket earlier as direct evaluation of computationally intractable maximizing this term is a maximum likelihood estimation problem we would like to minimize the tail divergence between this and this as i explained to sample pz easily in the latent space also with an added advantage of obtaining closed form relation of the kl divergence between pz and q lambda z given x we take pz to be a standard normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1 and q lambda z given x to be like this also another normal distribution here this is the covariance matrix is constrained to the diagonal matrix to keep computation easy and uh, again a lot of mathematics but final this final expression is easy it's a closed form expression that we get by some algebraic manip manipulation uh, another technique i wanted to talk about real quick is batch normalization which is a very useful technique introduced to improve the performance of vae and uh, neural networks in general for co computer vision tasks using batch norm normalization output of every hidden layer is standardized over every single mini batch pass in the training session it would be clear if we get some pictorial presentation so suppose we have a classifier and we want the classifier to classify between some images which contains cat and which doesn't have a cat in the image so if our training data contains only black cat and all other non cat images and then we after training we introduce uh, cat images which are colorful cat in general and non cat our classifier won't be able to perform that good as it did for the training data set this is called Uh, this has a very fancy term called covariate shift which means the a shift in the data points in its distribution in distribution model so so suppose the the data points of black cats were like this red thing uh, red data points and the non cats are like this black crosses so usually before if we don't use batch normalization our model would likely a uh, learn a straight line difference with to separate these data points like this straight line when we introduce this colorful cat this the data points of this colorful cat lies here which our model won't be able to classify correctly because now they have only has learned a straight line which clearly don't classify them accurately that so that's why we want to we want to use batch normalization so that even if our data points vary by some amount it normalizes it back and our our model learns faster learns more reliable denser representation so these are the some advantages of using batch normalization which makes our model to learn faster makes it converge better in a better value and in a faster manner while each training iteration will become somewhat slower because the extra normalization calculations during the forward pass but eventually it would converge quickly so overall computation becomes fast so 
these are the I use four layer deep fully connected network as both encoder and decoder for the MNIST dataset. I take one more minute. So this is the oh yeah. So this is the uh, convergence of loss function without using batch normalization. And this is the generated data set without batch normalization. Next I have used batch normalization and uh, it converges to a better value and much faster rate. And this is the generated data set which is a bit more cleaner. These are using the four, four dimension for the latent space instead of two with, without BN batch normalization. This is again using BN so you can see that the loss function compared to previous one converges faster. So that's the point of using BN. These are the data points generated using batch normalization. Yeah. These are the references. Thank you.